Welcome everyone to Open Enrollment Comes But Once a Year. Thank you all so much for joining us. Our moderator for today's call is Beth Allen. She'll be answering the questions you send through the Q&A today. We will try our best to answer all of your questions, but if for whatever reason we are unable to get to your question today, please follow up with your advisor for further assistance. Today's presentation is being recorded. We will be sharing the recording in the follow-up email and on the NFP website. If there are any portions of this call that you missed, by Monday, you will receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's call. Joining us today are Roger Abramson, Vice President and Council of Benefits Compliance at NFP, and Doug Lemmerman, Vice President and Council of Benefits Compliance at NFP. Roger, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amber. Um, appreciate everyone being here. Uh, Obviously, we're going to be talking about open enrollment. We're just a couple of days away from the beginning of fall into a new season and open enrollment season, especially for calendar plans, obviously, um, is very, very important. Let's go over the uh, agenda on the next slide. Uh, there's a lot going on and we're going to, Doug and I are going to cover it all uh, for you. Uh, we're going to talk about plan documents a little bit. Don't worry, we won't belabor that too much, but they are extremely important. The notices we need to have go out to folks, how they need to go out, distribution. Uh, also important topic, documenting offers of coverage when you offer these coverage, these plans to your folks. And we're not going to forget about the folks that aren't there all the time, folks out on COBRA and on leave and so forth. We're going to touch on cafeteria plan rules, everyone's favorite topic, um, but extremely important. And if done well in open enrollment, don't cause a lot of problems during the plan year. HSA eligibility, another big one uh, in terms of how folks are eligible and sometimes without realizing it, unless we tell them, ineligible as well. Certification of information, fiduciary obligations, and as a general topic, designing open enrollment to fit the needs and uh, uh, culture of your company. So we're going to go on to the major theme of this today, and it is well begun is half done. Uh, I That is a, a quote from noted employee benefits uh, expert Mary Poppins. I didn't know where that came from. I used to know that quote and I had to look it up. That's where it comes from. Uh, essentially, if we can get open enrollment correct, it solves a lot of problems throughout the plan year. We uh, have our rules in place. We have our benefits and options in place. We have our elections in place. And it sets the tone for so much of the rest of the plan year. Half your issues, if you may have them, generally speaking, will be taken care of if we can get open enrollment correct. So let's start. On the next slide, with plan documents. Now, I realize everybody's, well, we're here about open enrollment. Why are you talking about plan documents and all that kind of stuff? Well, because again, what do we say? Well begun is half done. What are we doing? We're doing open enrollment for our benefits plans. What sets the rules and the tone and the foundation for our benefits plans? Plan documents, okay? ERISA requires that every welfare plan, subject to ERISA, and this is a quote, be established and maintained pursuant to a written instrument. Now, you have probably never had, nor have I, anyone come into your office or email you asking you, hey, what does our written instrument say? We don't call it that. We call that plan documents and so forth. What are their purposes? Well, two groups. Uh, let's talk about participants. Uh, it puts participants on notice of the benefits they are entitled to, could be, and their obligation under the plan. What benefits do the plan offer? How do the benefits get to, or excuse me, how do the participants get to use, elect these benefits? And then let's talk about the plan administrator uh, provides guidelines by which the plan administrator makes these decisions. How does the plan operate? What are the plan administrator's obligations? All of those sorts of things. Moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about the various ways um, that these are presented. And yes, a little bit of this is a review, but again, what do we have to do? These set the rules of the plan. If there are changes and updates we have to make, these are the places they have to be done. Common formats, plan documents, summary plan description uh, as separate documents. Sometimes we call that the SPD. The plan document, the SPD combined, we like to do that sometimes, but that's okay. Is all the required ERISA languages included? Again, this is the time of year to make sure we got all that um, together and compliant. Also the ever popular wrap document. What do those do? We get the ERISA provisions. They wrap the insurance materials and the benefit materials all together in one great package. 
Regarding the SPD, the initial SPD generally must be provided within 90 days of when a participant or a beneficiary becomes covered by the plan. Thereafter, the general rules are required distribution technically every five years or even 10 years if there are no material plan changes. That's rather rare, but okay. Uh, a lot of places, and this is generally might be the way to go, annually, just annually distri uh, distribute it. Um, then you get to everything taken care of on an annual basis, preferably, if possible, around about open enrollment. The next slide. Uh, we're talking about plan changes, right? Every year, we got the plan coming up. What are we going to do? What are we going to change? What are we going to offer? What's uh, what's uh, what are the differences and so forth that people are electing? ERISA requires timely notice of quote material plan changes to group health plans, right? And uh, what is material? There's really no definition. It's kind of a facts and circumstances sort of sort of thing. Uh, basically, what would employees need to know to make benefit related decisions? Did something change that would probably be quote unquote material to that decision, then it's probably a material plan change. Examples include elimination or reduction of benefits, uh, increase in employee paid premiums, new conditions, requirements to obtain services, and so on. Changes also sometimes come from another place, uh, sponsor directed or a uh, result from legislative changes as well, which we're familiar with from time to time. Typically, not always, but typically, benefit changes are scheduled to occur for the new plan year. Once again, what is open enrollment? It's our kickoff time for the new plan year. Sometimes the open enrollment question would be, where do we put it? Can we put it in the SPD? Can we make it a separate summary of material modifications? Well, a lot of folks uh, put them all together. Notice can be provided in an updated SPD or in a summary of material modification, which is the standalone document that explains the specific plan change. However folks do it, however you want to do it, participants need to know the information they need to uh, operate and participate and elect in the plan when changes occur. Moving on the next slide, what is one of the most common changes? Annual benefit limits. We're all familiar with these. Our friends, the agencies provide updated limits. Uh, HSA limits, FSA contribution maximums, and so forth. Your systems and enrollment guides, et cetera, et cetera, should reflect these updated limits. Uh, plan documents and SPDs, what we just talked about a few minutes ago, should also be updated if specific dollar amounts are reflected in them. Uh, also, should be always reminded, or excuse me, employers should be reminded of any use it or lose it provisions, particularly in conjunction with these new limits. Uh, sometimes in it happens in other places in the world or whatever. There's a mistake. They did, the, the limits weren't updated. People make an election and they didn't know about the new limits. We don't want to do that. Double check those. On the next slide, in case you're wondering, hey, what are these new limits? Are they out? Yes, some are. I'm not going to read all of these to you. Uh, we have the HSA and HDHP limits for 2024. Those have been updated. Uh, we're still waiting on the Health FS Day excuse me, health FSA uh, limits for 2024. They're coming out pretty soon. But you can see some of the other HRAs, uh, at least in the um, EB HRAs, uh, have been updated as well. Happily, as you'll see on the next slide, we have a publication uh, that is continually updated on employee benefits annual limits. And uh, as the new limits come out, it is updated and it is available. If you would like a copy of or updated information about that, please contact your NFP contact and they will uh, connect you immediately with that information. Which is great, by the way. I have one right in front of me now. We're going to the next slide. All right, we talked about all the documents and the changes and the things you got to document and tell folks. Now, what do we else do we have to tell our folks? We got to talk about notices, providing the correct notices and when. So going to the next slide, we have about a big five or six here. You'll see five and a half, depending on how you look at it, that are required annually in the open enrollment period. They're a bit random if you kind of look at them. Some of them are, but here they are. We're going to start uh, with the summary of benefits and coverage on the next slide. This is, happens to be my favorite notice. I'm, you know, I'm an employee benefits person, so I have a favorite notice, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not cool that way, but I like it. The reason I like it is because it's a notice that's actually written in a way that 
people might understand and read and it answers questions that they might have. And it's very, very useful. It is required during open enrollment. We might recall this came out about <clears throat> during the healthcare reform law because it was a way for folks to finally understand or attempt to understand what their health coverage is. I sort of like to think of it as the kind of the nutrition facts on the back of cereal boxes where, you know, it takes just here's what you need to know. Here's the information. It's there. It is required once again during open enrollment. Um, it's a five page document and it summarizes the plan benefits, has the questions, the answers. You might use them on a day to day basis when you get questions about the plan, what the, uh, the uh, health plan covers itself. There is a template provided by the DOL, as often is the case. This is uh, an important part. This requirement is imposed on the employer and the insurer. It's a notice so nice. It's required twice, but if you have an insured plan, if the insurer sends out the <clears throat> proper notice, then that would be fine. But the employer needs to make sure and not assume that the insurer has done this in the carrier. Over the past few years, carriers and everybody have gotten better about this, but it still is a requirement imposed on both in the case of insured plans. It's a very, very important notice in the case of group health plans, but most of us are familiar with those and they need to be part of open enrollment. Again, this helps folks decide what they want to elect with the information they need. On the next slide, we have the CHIP notice. Most people are familiar with CHIP, C-H-I-P, Children's Health Insurance Program, sometimes also known as S-CHIP. The S stands for state. Essentially, this notifies employees of their right to enroll uh, in the health plan if they happen to lose Medicaid or they may become eligible for premium assistance. Uh, this is provided annually once again uh, as part of open enrollment, and it applies based on the state where the employee lives. While it's a federal match program uh, from the federal government, it's uh, operated state by state. So that's the second notice. It has to go out with open enrollment. And the third notice is the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Notice. Essentially, plans that provide medical and surgical mastectomy benefits must notify participants of benefits for uh, reconstructive surgery and physical complications and so forth. It's an annual and SPD requirement. Um, some folks think, well, if I include it in the SPD, that's fine, right? Well, it is if you distribute it annually, because remember, this is an annual notice. Um, there's some model notice language. You can see that there. Uh, most people are familiar with it. This is part of another notice that's required in open enrollment. The fourth required notice is our next one, Medicare Part D Disclosure. Um, most people are familiar with this one as well. Uh, essentially, this tells folks whether uh, the uh, plan, the group health plan has what's called creditable coverage. Medicare Part D is the prescription drug part of Medicare that was added <clears throat> early on uh, about 20 years ago. Um, and essentially, it tells folks, hey, we have creditable coverage. Now, no one knows what that means. What it means is essentially, hey, does our group health plan offer this, you know, <laughs> prescription drug benefits? How do they compare to that which Medicare does? Unfortunately, the notice doesn't really make that clear. They call it creditable coverage. Be that as it may, that's for there uh, to be delivered to all uh, Medicare Part D eligible individuals. The big problem people have is, well, I don't know who that is. Well, here's a way to solve that problem. Just give it to everyone. And then Everyone who was an eligible individual has their notice and it's taken care of. Interestingly, this is actually required at several points. Uh, you can see the five there on an annual basis prior to October 15th, um, which is fine, except that open enrollment <coughs> may occur a little bit after that. At any rate, prior to an individual's initial enrollment period for Part D, by the way, if you on the open enrollment. If it is after October 15th, we still have to add the other distribution as well. At any rate, when the individual originally becomes eligible under the plan, upon a change in the plan's creditable status regarding the coverage of the <clears throat> prescription drugs, and of course, upon an individual's request. And uh, as per usual, uh, there is a model notice available for the Medicare Part D creditable coverage. But again, the big thing to take away of this is just give it to everyone. And then all the eligible individuals will have been covered and the others can have one for future reference, I guess. On the fifth notice, there's really two of these and these are wellness notices. Uh, wellness programs are very popular, of course, people love them, um, and, but they, what they also love is non-discriminated uh, or healthcare and coverage provided on a non-discriminatory basis. These two things sometimes 
run afoul of each other. And hence we have some of these rules and notices. The first one to be uh, mindful of is the reasonable alternative standard notice. Um, it is essentially for uh, health contingent wellness programs, as people like to call them. They used to be called standards based. These are for programs that are not participatory, pretty much anything other uh, than that. You see some examples there. Uh, essentially, you have to tell folks that, yeah, we have this health contingent wellness program that does these things, but we have to provide and we must tell you about a reasonable alternative standard if you cannot do that for some of the reasons you'll see in the sample language below. Uh, just a little notation, don't this sample language is just sort of general. There are certain different rules uh, regarding tobacco and so forth. This is just here for illustrative purposes. But that's the first wellness notice that has to uh, go out during open enrollment, assuming there is a wellness program. The second one is the next one, and that's the EEOC wellness notice. And that's essentially required if a wellness program includes a medical inquiry. And it tells folks, hey, we're going to have medical inquiries, for instance, biometric screening, health risk assessments, and so forth. And here's what we're going to, uh, the information we're going to get, and here's what we're going to do with it. Uh, you may be familiar or not with the uh, ongoing battle that AARP tends to have with EEOC regarding uh, wellness programs. A few years ago, a lot of these uh, requirements, the general ones, were invalidated. Ignore all that. I'm just mentioning it now because some people think that there's no more need for any notices. Those are two different things, more or less. This notice is still required um, and just send it out as part of the open enrollment. Even employers who have a wellness program that is administered by their insurer should ensure that the notice is being distributed. Sometimes, once again, like with the SPD, there's an assumption, oh, well, that's the insurer's job. Well, it may or may not be, but it's still your job to make sure that is going out and working with them accordingly. Uh, timing is important here. Um, it needs to go to the employee before the employee has to complete the medical inquiry. Doesn't do the employee a lot of good to be given notice about what is going to happen to this medical inquiry if they get the notice after it. And that is the list of those main five notices, five and a half. And we're going to go to the next slide. And you may see on this list a few notices that you thought, gosh, don't these have to go out open enrollment? Not necessarily. Um, there's a list of yours. You're familiar with them, HIPAA notice. FMLA, exchange notice, and so forth, they're not necessarily required annually. As I said, it's a little random, it's just a function of when some of these laws are passed and the interest so forth, but they are required in other circumstances. And the question you may ask is, well, how in the world am I going to keep track of all of this? Well, on the next slide, we have information about yet another publication we have, which is fantastic, is also sitting in front of me right now. And this is a chart detailing all of the information you'll need to know about required group health plan notices and when they need to go out and to whom. Also importantly, how, and that is about the distribution of notices. And for that, I'm gonna turn that over to my colleague, Doug, to pick it up from here. Uh, thanks, Roger. Uh... By way of further introduction, uh, introduction uh, I'm Doug Lemmerman. I'm the newest member of the benefits compliance team. Just started back in April, but I'm not new to compliance. I worked as general counsel and vice president of compliance for a TPA for about 20 years and for a competitor for a while before coming to NFP. I live and work in North Carolina, right outside of Winston-Salem. Right now, I'm going to cover the next three topics, including distribution of notices and documents documenting offers of coverage under the ACA, starting with this slide, 22. Rogers covered the, all the different types of notices that the plan administrator has to give to the employers, employees and participants, including annual or periodic required notices, disclosures, enrollment materials, SBCs, SMMs, and even SPDs. Some notices have to be given annually, some to new hires, some to employees when they enroll in a health plan, some to employees or family members who enroll mid-year, and some that are needed only in certain situations. Question is, how do you provide the notices and the materials to all the employees? You have options, but some are better than others. ERISA requires that notices and disclosures be provided to participants and sometimes to beneficiaries using measures that are reasonably calculated to ensure actual receipt of the materials. Keep in mind that the requirement is not that all notices are actually received. The method just must be reasonably calculated to ensure receipt, which is different than actual receipt. If an accepted method is used and documented, 
actual receipt by everyone is not actually required. First, there's the U.S. mail. First class is always acceptable. So is second and third class if return postage and address corrections are included. Current addresses of employees must be maintained by the employer to use this method. This can get pricey if you have a lot of employees. And there's hand delivery at the worksite. This will work, assuming workers all report to the worksite at some point, which has become less likely since COVID-19 and the switch to remote and hybrid workplaces. There's also the issue of documenting the hand delivery. Uh, just as an example, I used to work for a company that had about 120 employees. We all attended annual enrollment meetings where packets were handed out and we all signed a form that was passed around that said we said we received the packets. And the HR benefits person attached a list of documents included in the packet with an example of each. Then the HR rep had to track down the employees who didn't actually attend the meeting for whatever reason. But it's uh, uh, because of the size of the company and the fact that we all worked in the same place, it worked out. Then there's electronic media. This includes a couple of electronic distribution methods like delivery by email or email attachment or the company website. It also includes distribution by magnetic disc, CD or DVD, which aren't used much anymore, but they're still available and allowed. Uh, these electronic methods are all available as long as the safe harbor conditions are met. And these are the rules for electronic distribution safe harbor. You don't have to use these rules if you don't want to, but if you do, you're considered to have complied with the reg requirements. The safe harbor basically breaks down everybody into two sets, those with work-related computer access and those without work-related computer access. Work-related computer access is a little narrower than it actually sounds. The reg said means that those whose access to the electronic information system at work is an integral part of their employment duties. This would include someone who has a home office with a computer and company system access, but it would not include an employee who has access to the company system only through a computer in the break room or in a conference room in the office. For those with work-related access, the company just has to give notice when a new disclosure or notice has become available, let them know what it is, and that they can get a paper copy of the notice if they want one. For those without access, it's a little more complicated if you want to give notice electronically. Basically, you have to have their affirmative consent to receive notices electronically after it has been explained to them, what they might be getting, that they can take back their consent whenever they want to, that they can get a paper copy on request, and what sort of hardware and software will be required to receive the notices. Don't forget non-employees like COVID participants, alternate recipients under a QUIMSO, employees on leaves as absent retirees and whoever else is not actually in the office. For anybody who does not consent to electronic delivery notices, you have to use some other method like the mail. This slide is a reminder about the few situations when delivery just to the employee is not enough, or when notices are due to individuals at any time during the year, like COBRA notices, FMLA, and HIPAA notices. So down there in the second bullet on this slide, those situations include the COBRA initial notice, which could needs to go to the enrolled spouse when that happens or to could be in the middle of the year. The COBRA election notice uh, could be in the middle of the year. The FMLA notice of non-payment of premium that uh, Roger went over a little while back and the HIPAA wellness plan notice of reasonable alternatives also uh, that Roger discussed a little bit back there. So just successfully distributing the notices and materials to the right people at the right times isn't enough for compliance or protection from liability. The company has to document that it is in compliance by documenting all the steps it took to follow the rules. If the DOL ever asks, you will need to prove that you followed the rules. The plan administrator will want to have policies and procedures in place, not only for the actual distribution, but for the records of steps that were taken, like certificates of mailing for notices that were mailed, copies of notices that were sent, and dates and method for use of used for distribution. Everything that shows that you followed your own procedures. If you ever end up in court about whether an employee received a notice, it will be up to you to prove that you followed the distribution rules. Now we're going to move on to another area of documentation under the ACA, the employer mandate, and the offer of coverage. Well, several years ago, the courts did away with the requirement that everybody has to have health coverage or pay a fine or tax. 
but the requirement that employers offer coverage to all full-time employees or pay a penalty is still around. So all applicable large employers who have 50 or more employees have to offer minimum essential coverage to all employees and their children who work 30 or more hours per week. If they don't, and if an employee enrolls in a plan under the exchange and gets a subsidy, then the employer is subject to penalties. Some of you might have received that scary 226J letter from the IRS that tells you how much penalty you'll have to pay if you don't offer minimum essential coverage to your employees. So there's a requirement to offer coverage, but the regs don't tell you how to prove you offered coverage. And again, it will be up to the employer to prove that an offer was made when the employee qualifies for a subsidy. You can try to prove it by showing your enrollment procedure that is designed to cover all employees, but the safest way is to get all your employees who are offered coverage but decline to sign a waiver that you can keep in your file. And don't forget about affordability. This is a quick reminder about affordability of the plan you offer to your employees. The health plan coverage that you have to offer to all full-time employees must also be minimum value and affordable, or the employer will have to be, pay a penalty for any employee who gets exchange coverage and gets a subsidy. You can get 226J letters about this one too. What's minimum value? The definition is a plan that includes coverage for an inpatient hospitalization and physician services and covers at least 60% of the total allowed costs of the coverage. Affordability is when the employee's required contribution toward coverage is a certain percentage of their household income for self-only coverage, and that percentage is adjusted every year and has so far always gone down. Uh, it was 9.61% for 2022, 9.12% for 2023, and it will be 8.38%. Oh, it says 3.833, I think it's 38% for 2024. The regs offer three safe harbors that an employer can use to establish that the coverage is affordable. So if you use one of them, the plan is considered affordable. And they include the federal poverty level safe harbor where the plan sets the lowest cost self-only premium at or below the federal poverty level for a single individual. The form W-2 safe harbor where the plan uses the employee's form W-2 wages to set the lowest cost self-only premium or the rate of pay, that rate of pay self har safe harbor where the plan uses the employee's hourly rate or pay or salary to calculate the lowest cost self-only premium. And of course, when the employer reduces the cost of coverage by offering a credit against the contributions, like on a wellness program, that credit reduces the contribution amount that accounts for affordability. I mentioned this before in the context of sending notices out to employees. Some people who aren't actually working or have terminated employment should be included in the annual enrollment. They're easy to forget when they're not working. And that includes COBRA participants. They have to be treated like similarly situated active employees. So you have to send the enrollment materials and give them the same choices in the health plan options as regular employees. And don't forget to send COBRA notices to employee and spouses when they enroll both as new hires and special enrollees during the year. FMLA is also an example. The same rule applies to employees out on FMLA leave. They're entitled to participate in annual enrollment, so make sure to send the enrollment materials to them and enter their changes, if any. And here are some others that you need to keep an eye on because they're just not around very much. Don't forget retirees, employees on other types of leave or disability, alternate recipients under qualified medical child support orders. It's actually a good idea to keep a list with your annual enrollment materials year to year so you don't forget anybody on this list of people who are not actually in the office much. And now to talk about cafeteria plans, I'm gonna send it back to Roger. Thank you, Doug. Um, yep. We're going to talk about Section 125, also known as cafeteria plans, uh, also known commonly as pre-tax. We're going to start on the next slide. And there's just a few slides in this section, but I'm going to linger on it just a bit um, because this little area is one of the prime areas in the world of open enrollment where uh, things can kind of go awry if communications aren't 
aren't quite where they need to be. I am pretty sure everyone, unless in generally speaking, is familiar with cafeteria plans, section 125, they allow for pre-tax contributions, right? We can do health plans, dental, vision, some other things as well. Uh, folks can pay for their portion, what's called pre-tax, lowers their taxable income, uh, they're part of their uh, payroll tax and so forth, and they get the coverage and get to save on taxes accordingly. A very, very nice thing, but there comes with rules, as we know. Um, qualifying event rules, essentially, generally speaking, as we know, when during open enrollment, a participant goes through there and they make their elections for their pre-tax elections and so forth. That's the election they're going to have for the entire plan year, the whole plan year. What do we talk about? Well begun is half done. Once they make it, that's going to be their election, unless certain things occur in their lives, life events or so forth, or other things that fall into some limited exceptions, uh, in which case, in some cases, uh, that participant may mid-year make a change to their election uh, and on consistent with whatever that change may be. So. I'm sure everyone on your, we've done this before. You've done, you understand why this is so important. Open enrollment, when you make this election for cafeteria plans, that's the one you got. So people need to make them knowingly open, understanding all of the rules accordingly. So we'll go on the next slide. <clears throat> the regulations do not dictate open enrollment seasons. That's up to the employer and its plan design. There's nothing where you say, oh, the employer has to has to have it within six weeks before in this window before their plan year starts. It's kind of it's wide open. It's up for the employer to do that. But elections must always be prospective and made prior to the beginning of the plan year. If for calendar year plan years uh, would uh, start by definition on January 1st, the elections and open enrollment must happen before. That January 1st, everything needs to be all wrapped up and done. Okay, there is uh, no allowance. You'll see this toward the end on the last bullet point. There's no grace period. Okay, it's not like, well, we had open enrollment from uh, December 1st to December 15th, but gosh, you know, uh, through, through January 15th, if you change your mind, that's fine. No, it's done. It's all over. It's done before the plan year begins. The employer can allow if it wants. Uh, changes between uh, open enrollment and the start of the plan year, but it doesn't have to. Uh, again, it's very important and wise to keep things as simple and as a solid line as possible so that things can be accurate and ready for the plan year to go. But the bottom line is once the plan year starts for calendar years, once that ball drops uh, for the new year, uh, everything is good to go. There's no grace period, there's no look backs with exception of a few things, which we'll talk about next. So <clears throat> we'll put, this is about mistakes, but as we well know, before we get to this, there are a few qualifying events and so forth, uh, what people call life events and where you can change your elections. Uh, that This slide and the next one are not about those. These are about these things that occur year after year that hopefully some good planning and communication during open enrollment can limit. Uh, for example, as we know, somebody likes uh, health insurance and, and, oh, we get married or we add a new dependent. Well, we can add a person to the plan. That's something you can do mid-year. The, the rules aren't going to make you wait until the next plan year to add your child uh, to the plan. But you cannot drop coverage or add coverage for, uh, you know, just because you want to. All right. Um, there is no actual express uh, uh, list of a mistake allowing employees to change their coverage. However, there's an understanding that an employer may be able to make some changes after the start of the plan year. If there is clear and convincing, that's a very high standard, evidence of a mistake or error. For instance, there's a clear mistake if the employee is ineligible for the coverage chosen. Okay, that's a, that would be an example of a mistake. But buyer's remorse, I guess we'd call it, is not a mistake or error that would allow for a change election. And this happens every year, in, inevitably somewhere, somewhere along the line, a few months into the program. Somebody's like, well, wait a minute, you know, I bought this insurance, but you know what? Look it back. I don't need it. It's all good. Can I, you know, change it back? No, that's that's uh, it's part of what insurance is. Sometimes you get it and you need it. You don't. That's the, the rules do not allow for that. If they allowed for folks being able to, you know, change their elections because they couldn't predict the future, well, we wouldn't have these rules to begin with. However, if there is a mistake, and we'll go over how to determine that on the next slide, which I'm not ready for yet, the general IRS guidance 
says put the parties in place they would have been absent the error okay and boy let's catch them early if we can okay because correcting withholding and salary reductions putting the money back or taking more out or whatever is much easier doing the same year the same tax year the same calendar year if it's after the year end now we have extra problems now we're in a new tax year we got to do we got to redo our w-2s we got to redo our tax filings it's a mess it's a mess so the sooner the better along those lines on the next slide how do we determine what's an actual mistake well it's again it has to be clear and convincing evidence and we just look at i guess you know the totality of the circumstances okay an employee comes to you and says hey i made a mistake okay well what what happened here i need to fix it well let's look at some things let's look at the employee's past elections and benefit usage was this so was this really way off is this a, an accident uh plausible evidence of a clerical mistake for instance uh for instance somebody put five thousand input in the system and that could have been 500 or 50 say the employee elected 500 but it was 5,000 but if it was 1,390 dollars that's a bit you know indicative that there was not an actual mistake made uh, assessment of the employee's truthfulness time elapsed since the first payroll date after the election was enforced this comes up a lot uh sometimes folks say oh i just noticed that uh i had a lot more taken out of my check than i thought it's a big mistake but it's july it's been six months um there may have been a mistake, but there comes a time when you're deemed to have knowledge. You need to bring that up earlier. At some point, it probably wasn't a mistake. You've kind of adopted it. You move forward. The sooner, the better. Uh, and again, along those lines, times, time elapsed since the first payroll date after the election was enforced. Changed circumstances experienced by the employee that might be evidence of reconsideration rather than a clerical mistake. Mm, you know, it seems like, man, no, it seems like you're trying to call it a mistake, but it's not. Or other extrinsic evidence of a mistake. Why am I spending so much time on this? Everybody knows because this is the most uh, the most popular question on the board that comes up after plan year start. Can we change the election? The employee made a mistake. The employee made a mistake. Well, mistakes is a very narrow window for what that is. Um, and you have to look at each circumstance one at a time and understand that whatever decision is made has an impact going forward in terms of establishing a precedent. Uh, before going to the next thing, I want to talk about the one of the biggest issues that occurs in open enrollment that could be a mistake or not it's hard to debate but if we do it correctly it won't show up as much this is very common we all know what health fsas are we know they cover the uh, employee spouse and their dependents we also know what dcaps or dependent care fsas are most of us on here it involves uh, child care or elder care dependent care while the employees at work however just because we all know that a lot of employees don't know the difference between those things and this is one of the most common things and some employers have make your election for health FSA, and then they have one for dependent care FSA. And inevitably, one employee is like, ah, I got my child. There's going to be some medical expenses next month. I'm going to choose my, or next year. So I, this is great. I'm going to collect all this money for dependent care FSA, because to them, that's what that means, because they don't remember or don't know. Inevitably, this happens. Is that a mistake? Is it not? It's very debatable. We could talk about that another time, but we could avoid it altogether by making sure in our communications and so forth that when you when they're walking through it they you make very clear the difference between these two things that healthcare FSA and dependent care FSAs cover vastly different things and I just mentioned that as an example of how if you plan forward in our communication and so forth we don't have to answer these difficult questions on the other uh, side after the plan year starts and with that I'm going back over to Doug for the next reel, which is HSA eligibility, a fun one as well. Doug, you're on mute. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see now. It's about HSA eligibility. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. The um, an HSA obviously is a bank account for uh, for employees who have enrolled in a high deductible health plan and for and have no other impermissible coverage. Uh, the health uh, the high deductible health plan also has prescribed limits that uh, Roger addressed uh, a little while ago that change every year. Uh, deductible and out-of-pocket. 
And the uh, employees not only can have no other no other impermissible coverage, but they have to be enrolled in a high deductible plan uh, for at any t- any month where they want to make a contribution to an HSA. Impermissible coverage is uh, coverage other than oops, sorry, uh, other than preventive care before the plan deductible is met. So in a high deductible plan, there's a high deductible, and the uh, the rules are that you can't have anything covered before that deductible is met including uh, general purpose health FSA coverage of the employee or spouse, Medicare, especially difficult due to possible retroactive application of Part A. Sometimes when you enroll and and become entitled to Medicare, it's retroactive to the beginning of a month in the past. And another medical plan. For example, a spouse covers an employee with traditional plan, but uh, and didn't realize that it would affect the HSA uh, eligibility for the employer, the other spouse's plan. The, uh, there is also a, a contribution, a catch-up contribution uh, that uh, is allowed for employees over a certain age, and it's it's uh, it's the it's actually a monthly benefit. It's divided up, prorated, just like the uh, regular HSA maximum election amount is. <coughs> so, gosh, I did it again. Sorry. The uh, so the employer uh, should be careful, as Roger keeps pointing out, to make sure that the uh, the rules of the HA contributions are clearly explained uh, to the employees before they sign up, uh, and uh, and so they'll know what they're dealing with. And the last bite, uh, bullet on this slide mentions the uh, the process where you can, uh, instead of uh, being a, if you're not eligible for the full 12 months of a year, if you are eligible uh, at the the last month of the year. Sometimes you can uh, you could be uh, give the entire contribution for the year under certain circumstances, and the employer, of course, has to send the contributions to the bank where the trustee money, who's holding the money for the employee, is holding the money. And that so that's a reminder that the HSA is actually an employee's bank account. The employee himself is responsible for knowing whether or not he's eligible, even though the employer, if that if the employer knows that the employee is not uh, eligible, then they shouldn't be making the contribution on the employee's behalf and during the year. The uh, employee may have to set up the account, uh, so that should be communicated uh, clearly to the employees also as the account is set up, uh, and if it's not actually part of the enrollment process. The uh, the, there, there are tax consequences if an employee uh, makes contributions during a month and they weren't eligible to. And uh, that's uh, this graphic here shows the uh, an IRS publication 969, which uh, which shows a lot of information, good information about HSA accounts. So, moving on to slide 43. Sometimes employees want or need to change something in the health plan, like getting married, they got married or they got divorced, they have a baby, they're enrolled in, uh, trying to enroll a domestic partner, or they're losing other coverage. So uh, what is adequate proof for the employer that the event has actually occurred? Many, plan- many plans have gone for years for just taking the word of their employees who claim to have experienced an event and want to make a change. But as times change, particularly for larger plans where you can't possibly know everybody personally, plans might decide that a little documentation would be nice. And if you've ever had a dependent audit, you'll know what I mean. You'd be surprised to learn how many enrolled dependents and spouses are not actually eligible. Plans can require documentation of these changes before they will make the change, anything that's reasonable really. But the key is if you implement a documentation requirement, You need to consistently require it from everybody to avoid allegations of favoritism or discrimination, not just from the people you don't know or are suspicious about. An affidavit from the employee is a good middle ground. It might make the employee less likely to fudge or forget to disenroll a dependent that has aged out or gotten divorced. Some HR systems have a way to save and store documents for these events. Fiduciary duty. We're getting close to the end and we want to touch on fiduciaries and their duties. We always hear the term fiduciary, but who exactly are the fiduciaries in an ERISA plan? ERISA requires that one or more fiduciaries be actually named in the plan document 
That's to let the participants know who it is. It's usually the plan sponsor, the employer, and ERISA also requires every plan to have a plan administrator, which is usually the same as the plan sponsor, but different from a third-party administrator who processes claims for the plan. Some plans have a trust, which has a trustee or trustees. Basically, it's any person or entity that exercises discretion in performing their job, in controlling and managing the operation and administration of the plan, or who exercises authority or control over the management or disposition of plan assets. Your title and whether or not you think you're a fiduciary doesn't really matter. So without getting too deep into it, the plan sponsor, employer, plan administrator, usually the same entity, is a fiduciary. Which individuals, employees of the plan sponsor, are fiduciaries depends on whether what their authority they have in the management of the plan. What is the fiduciary's duty? This is a summarized quote to discharge their duties solely in the interests of the participants and beneficiaries for the exclusive purpose of providing plan benefits with care, skill, prudence, and diligence in accordance with the documents and instruments governing the plan. So, no plan could function without assistance from vendors and service providers, and that includes the annual enrollment process. The vendors will not want to be fiduciaries, and their contracts will probably say that they aren't. But the plan sponsor can hire a vendor to perform enrollment functions, but the plan sponsor is still the fiduciary and has a duty to monitor the actions of the vendor, oversee the enrollment process, and maintain good records. Now, designing your open enrollment to fit your company. Plan administrators have options on how best to conduct the annual enrollment for their employees. The different options are compliant, but some might better suit the size and geography of the company as a practical matter. You can use paper enrollment forms or online enrollment software. Which way is best? Some things to consider for that question. Do your employees have access to computers? Are your employees generally computer savvy? Do you have a benefit system that you're comfortable with to handle the process? And do you have a passive or active enrollment process? Uh, in other words, do the employees have to re-enroll every year? Do the elections stay the same unless the employees actively make a change? How will you get the enrollment materials to your employees? Enrollment meetings or mailing or electronic? The answer will depend on your employees. Will your employees show up for meetings or are they never in the office? Would it be too expensive to mail the materials because of the number of employees? Can you comply with the electronic distribution safe harbor or will you end up mailing most of them anyway? Which way is the easiest way to prove that the employees receive the materials? The bottom line is that you have choices that are compliant and nobody knows your employees as well as you do. So you design your, your enrollment process with that in mind. And that is it for the slides in the presentation. All right, excellent information, uh, Doug and Roger. Thank you for that. So let's discuss maybe a couple of questions that we received um, in the question and answer field. Um, so going back to talking about notices, we did have a question from someone having to do with whether or not these notices also needed to go to COBRA participants. So do you all want to speak to that briefly? Uh, yeah, uh, sure, Beth. The, um, excuse me, as we, we covered that a little bit earlier, um, cover participants have to be treated just like uh, similarly situated active employees. So any notices that would go to the, uh, the active enrollees would go to the cover participants also. And that's, uh, and then since they're not uh, uh, a group of people that are actually still working, for, usually still walking, some of them are having cover for re, uh, reduction in hours, but most of them are out in all of our employees. So probably electronic distribution to those folks wouldn't work very well. Probably mailing is the best course. Absolutely. And I mean, that same answer goes for another group of folks who may or may not be active employees. So retirees, um, sometimes you have situations where you have children who are covered um, because their parent was subject to a qualified medical child support order. There are situations in which some documents and notices might have to go to their custodial parent as well. Um, and so if you're an employer with those types of populations, you want to be aware of the rules that can apply with those notices. 
So we got some more questions as it pertains to ACA affordability. Um, and so I know we got the question on wellness credits uh, and whether or not a wellness credit has to be counted in the ACA affordability calculations. Do y'all want to speak to that? Do you want me to speak to that? Go I ahead, think Beth. that I'm fine with Beth, you speaking that a little bit. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> sure. And shout out to Kelly Eggman for providing the answer yes. on that. Frankly, wellness credits are going to have to be factored into the analysis, but what the wellness program uh, stand or reward is given for is going to matter, right? And so basically, wellness program incentives are not going to be treated as if they're reducing the required contribution that the employee has to pay, unless it's related to tobacco use, okay? So if you have a tobacco surcharge, or some kind of credit for tobacco, um, then you would be able to basically um, take that away from the amount of, of contribution that's due from the employee. But if you have wellness rewards for anything else, right? So if you say, hey, do a biometric screening and we will give you a reward. Or if you say, hey, do a walking program or something else and we're going to give you a reward, um, then the rewards that are provided for those things that are not based on the tobacco standard are going to be included in the uh, ACA kind of affordability calculation such that it would kind of increase what the person is deemed to be paying. Okay, so keep that in mind. I think we also got another couple of ant questions about HSAs specifically. We, we sure did. And I right. thank for mentioning that, Beth, because I was going to jump in on that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> talking about cafeteria plan elections and the question was asked, uh, well, gosh, aren't HSA elections a little more loose uh, regarding those? And the answer is yes. Uh, as a general rule, uh, HSA elections uh, you're not locked in an open enrollment. If you say I'm going to put $100 in every payroll to my HSA, it is not. You're not locked in for the plan year as you are with most other elections. There are a few rules to that, though. Uh, for the first one is even if you change your election uh, during the plan year, and many people do because they want to adjust it upwards or downwards as they want to. That is prospective, so we can't get into March and go, "Gosh, you know, can I back these up? Down? I want to knock that down to fifty back for January and February." No, we've already done that. But going forward, absolutely, and those options must be provided by employers at least monthly. Uh, but yes, that's a very open deal. If we put things on a spectrum, and sometimes I do this, this is a pure rule of thumb. But if we were to talk about spectrum of how uh, how loose, so to speak, are are these election rules during the year, it is very, very difficult as a general rule to change a health FSA election. There are a few uh, options, life events that will allow for that, but not as many as people think. And so if you put that on one end of the spectrum there, in the middle, we talk about our major medical plans and other things. They, they have most of the ones people are familiar with. Dependent care or DCAPs tend to be a little more further down the spectrum. I don't want anyone to hear this, by the way, to hear that all of these plans uh, can always be changed no matter what. That just means the, the rules are a little more liberal, a moral use for, for dependent care plans. And then we have HSA elections sort of on the, the far end of the spectrum. But even they must be uh, perspective in nature, just like any kind of election. But yes, employers can or, and must allow folks to change their HSA elections prospectively at least once a month during the plan year. Thank you for that. And, you know, you talked quite a bit about qualifying events and kind of what can be changed when. And I just want to point out, I know we mentioned the publication that we have for qualifying events, but a really good thing about that publication is it not only lists them, but it also tells you which of the coverage offerings you can actually change which eat with each event. Um, and so I definitely recommend that publication if you are uh, an HR staff member who um, needs kind of a refresher on what can be changed based on what event. Absolutely. And uh, just a, a fine example is that a lot of folks, and we know this, Beth and Red does, they think every option or every reason an event occurs that we can change a major medical would apply to health FSA. And that is not always the case. And that surprises a lot of people, even those of us who have been in this area for years. And uh, again, that's why we've got to be real careful and open enrollment to make that very clear, particularly with health FSA elections, to participants who make those elections. 
And we got a couple of questions just to make that clear. The publication is our publication on Section 125 qualifying events, okay? So that is something that we can, um, you can request from an NFP advisor if you would like a copy, um, and they will provide that to you. Um, I want to kind of end out with the last couple minutes just talking about electronic distribution, right? So you all talked a bit about, you know, how you actually go about distributing the notices and how you, um, you know, how you need to meet the DOL's electronic safe harbor. I know that a lot of employers on the call are going to potentially be looking to put these types of notices and required documents on, let's say, an internal portal or an internal website uh, for the employer. Uh, will one of you speak specifically to kind of the, the issues inherent in that, or I can also speak to it. Doug, I'll defer to you on that, if that's okay. Yeah, and sure. Have... The, uh, it, and that is one of the electronic methods uh, that I briefly mentioned there in that slide there. Um, but it is a, uh, uh, there are other separate requirements for that. If you're going to, if you, the, the rule I think is that you can make that posting on the intranet for your uh, stuff for your notices, they require notices and, and things like that. As long as they, um, you, but you have to give them notice of when something has been posted, and they have to be able to access it um, as part of their as part of their job, like the other requirements of the uh, of the electronic distribution thing uh, requirements are. So the uh, you give them notice and and a link or an easy access to it on the computer system in order for that to be allowed. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point. And I think it's kind of the piece that employers sometimes forget. Just putting it on the portal is not really considered distribution, right? So the DOL is very interested um, in kind of actual receipt by the person. So if you just put it there and you don't tell them that you put it there, then there's not a good argument that they knew it was there and would be able to access it. So the DOL is going to look for those additional kind of steps from employers to make sure that you're ensuring that your people actually know that a, a, a given note or document is available to them for them to access it, okay? And then I think we got one more question um, about uh, just annual notices period and the question of whether or not uh, it's a best practice for these notices to go out in the annual benefit guide. Um, and I'll speak to this, guys, if you don't mind. Um, I think Absolutely. that whether or not it's appropriate for it to go in the annual enrollment guide will really depend on the timing of the, the notice uh, and the intended audience, right? Um, and so we very much focused on uh, the specific notices that we believe should always go into an annual open enrollment guide if you are using the open enrollment guide to provide annual notices. But there are other notices that probably shouldn't go into it depending on the timing or based on, again, the audience. So for example, we mentioned the Medicare Part D creditable coverage notice, but that notice is due by October 15th. So if you don't have open enrollment before that, you probably shouldn't send it uh, through open enrollment guide. You should probably send it before October 15th. Um, and even if you do or are able to submit that or, through, or give that out through an open enrollment guide, there's an additional requirement there to actually put a notice on the front of the guide telling the person that the Medicare creditable Part D notice is actually in the guide, which most employers, again, don't necessarily know is, is a requirement. OK, so that's not really a good um, you know, candidate to be put into the open enrollment guide in all situations. Another example I'll give for uh, is that, you know, sometimes we'll see employers put the COBRA initial notice into the open enrollment guide, but that notice is required to go to employees and their spouses, except you can't really prove that a spouse got a notice by giving an open enrollment guide to the participant, right, or to the employee. Um, and so that's also not a, another notice that's not appropriate in the guide. And so you want to make sure that you are um, aware of what the purpose of the different notices are and whether or not it's appropriate for, for it to go in there. Um, and so and so you want to consider that. OK, and then as far as the notices being updated, uh, many of them are updated by the DOL um, at, at different frequencies, right? So for example, the chip notice is updated twice a year. Um, and so you want to make sure you're using the most recent one. You don't want to have a chip notice from several years ago. And that one's specifically important because they update that to change around the states that actually have a Medicaid offering. And so that does change depending on what the states have going on, okay? And so keep in mind that even if you do, do use open enrollment as an opportunity to give out notices, you're not going to be able to set it and forget it. You're going to have to be able, you're going to have to look at it uh, in different years and make sure you're updating the notices as appropriate. 
All right, so that's gotten us to the end of our call. Thank you so much, Doug and Roger, uh, for your presentation today. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Amber, could you uh, kick off our outro? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Roger and Doug, for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us today. To reiterate, today's presentation was recorded. We will be sharing the recording in the follow-up email and on the NFP website. If there are any portions of this call that you missed, by Monday, you will receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At the end of this call, a survey will populate in a new window. Please take a brief moment to complete the survey as it lets us know what topics are important to our listeners and helps make our education program as current and relevant as possible. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.